Matthias, you're going to tell us about new stuff in here and, and, and what's happening and the strategies on, on, on how to work in the field. So uh, it's all yours. Am I on time? I think we need to wait for like <laughs> because, because I think the videos are automatically cut at... Okay. So we have to wait another 20 seconds or so? Uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, we can flip. Um, yeah. Can tell us a joke? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be really bad. I mean, that would be really bad. <laughs> Okay, so, um, okay, I'll, I'll just hand you the mic and you can fill up your time and start whenever you like. Okay. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. And it's actually right now, um, five o'clock, so I'm going to start. First, um, with a short introduction about myself. I'm a bit worried about seeing my face that big on the screen, but anyway. Um, so I'm uh, an application engineer by um, training and also a geographer. I studied geography and application engineering, and that's what I've been doing for the past couple of years, open source. Um, I've been quite heavily involved with uh, QG's development. And uh, meanwhile, I have, I'm the co-owner of a company called OpenJS.ch. We, we are based in whole Switzerland, um, which, if you happen to know, is quite multilingual. So we are all also quite multilingual there and do just like consulting and development and all sorts of things and still have a very, very strong base uh, in QJS, but like doing all the way um, to like Postgres and also, of course, like QField is one of our uh, most beloved babies that I will be presenting today. But it's actually not going to be a standard presentation uh, feature frenzy. Uh, I thought that it will be fun to just just have some people that we join on their way to the field and see how they work with the data, how the data flows where, uh, while, they're, while they're working out on the field. So before we start, I think I still need to lose some initial words at least about QField, about the app. Uh, I guess many of you have seen it before, that's why I'm not going to fill the next 20 minutes with new features, but let's start. So it's basically a field data collection app. Um, it has all the power of QGIS rendering below and uh, it's got the support for custom forms. It's actually pretty uh, much similar, pretty similar to what we've seen uh, in the last presentation about input because it was like the basis for input. Whereas, um, so that's like uh, why, why there are uh, very a lot of uh, things that are shared between the two apps. Um, it is possible to add and edit spatial data, so you can edit, uh, add and edit geometries, um, all sorts of like points and polygons and lines, and you can also edit them. And um, we're gonna add some more features in this area. I don't think I'll have the time to talk about new features, but maybe I will. Uh, of course, it, does e it has a GPS integration, and it has uh, also support for relational data models, meaning that you can have multiple tables that you feel like child features or child entries of um, existing features and so on. So let's start with, uh, with Matteo. Matteo is a biologist. Matteo is actually working on his own and um, he, is, he does not always have an uh, internet connection when he goes out. He likes to go to the forest and um, he just mostly, what he needs to know when he's somewhere out there on the field, he needs to know where he is and um, to see um, what like the soil type is where he is. So what um, Matteo does is he prepares at home in, let's see if the pointer works, yes. At home, um, at his QGIS desktop, he prepares himself a data set in a geo package and he's just packaging all that up and puts it onto his mobile phone and, uh, or tablet and just takes it out and out there he can use QField to work with the data to um, see where he is, uh, use the GPS and um, request detailed information about where he is. That's quite a trivial use case to do with probably any app out there. Um, so let's straight go to the second person of today which is Maya the beekeeper. I don't know if some of you have come across Maya so far already at this conference. If you didn't, in the end, I'll uh, introduce her a bit more and give you an outlook on what else she does. So she's um, actually retired and working now as a beekeeper, which is mostly a hobby for her, but she also does it um, to get a bit of money. And she's also, she's also working on her own, and she wants to know like what, how her beehives are doing. So she just goes there, and, uh, but she doesn't just only 
um, check what's what's going on. She like she she actually needs to to edit the data on the field, of course, and sometimes adds new beehives when she when she's out there and um, and looking for them. So it's pretty much the same setup. She can also like package her geo package and um, put it on the on the tablet and then start working it. But we see that like this arrow here is actually um, now pointing in two directions, so she can actually also change the data in her geo package. But since she's just working on her own, since there is no risk of conflicts, etc., in the end she can just go back, um, come back to the office, and use the same geo package that she's been using out there, back onto her QGIS, and and continue working there with whatever data she collected out there. That brings us straight to our third friend, which is Vlurin. Florin um, is a forestry manager, and he has um, a team of roughly 30 field workers, which, he, which are out there, and uh, they check actually for the safety of all the forests they have out there. So they need to go out and check all the, all the trees, um, how they do, if there is like some, some sick trees, um, some illnesses, some, maybe, maybe something dangerous from the last storm they had, and uh, they need um, they need to report it back in order to plan for the whole maintenance of these forests. Luckily, all over the area, there is um, at least a 3G, 3G uh, data coverage in the mobile network. So um, he does a setup where he doesn't really need offline data at all. So he's just always working online. He's uh, preparing himself in the, um, on his desktop computer, as you can see there, um, the project in QGIS, and then puts this project onto his mobile phone. But um, he doesn't put any data there. All he puts there is a QGIS project with a Postgres connection. Since QField is based on QGIS, it has also like um, access to many, 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 many different data providers. One of them is our most beloved Postgres and PostGIS provider. So they can all work in parallel on the data, and they see in real time what happens. And actually, Florin, he has put up um, a screen somewhere in his office where he has put a, a live uh, layer in QGIS. So whenever someone changes the data, a second later, it just pops up in his office and he can see how people are doing out there. Then there is also Nadia. Nadia um, works for a fiber network company. And she has quite a big team for who she is responsible. And um, they need to make sure that uh, the whole fiber network is stable and um, that they know like, where their subscribers are. And to do that, she has quite a big team of people out there. Um, unfortunately, or however, like just as life is, they sometimes also need to be somewhere underground to fix their cables so they do not always have um, data coverage. So when they go down there, they really want the things to be offline. So what she did in the first step was she uh, set up a Postgres database, which is quite a nice thing to have anyway in a big organization, and then uses QGIS desktop to prepare her project and gave, actually um, prepares projects for all the mobile phones in parallel um, with a geo package there um, to, to work on and then synchronizes them back later on. So what um, these uh, geo packages Geo packages do is next to just only um, being ha um, having written the data directly into it, they also need to record what changes are being done all the time. So they write a log of what is going on. So for every new um, feature that is added, they write it into the, into the log history. For every uh, attribute that is changed or geometry that is changed, that's going to be written into the log history inside this geo package. And whenever she comes back from, um, one comes back from a field trip and synchronizes the data back to the server, that's going to be applied um, like step by step onto the server. And um, so that's how things are replayed later on. However, she thinks it would be nice if not every of our users would always have to use QGIS or me, myself, I always have to prepare the project for them all the time. So what she did, she was just implementing um, on the server by using uh, the QGIS libraries in Python, the very same thing that the QField Sync plugin does on her desktop, and just does it on the server and uh, prepares that on a nightly basis, the latest dump from the server for all the mobile phones, which are synchronized 
with um, uh, ThinkThing or some other sort of app like Dropbox. Um, and um, then it's very much the same thing, just that all the things are automated and things are synchronized and people do not, know, do not need to click and uh, load the data all the time. So, she thinks, that's all nice and good. But hey, sometimes our people are not perfect and they do sometimes make a mistake. So why don't we add some additional things um, for uh, quality assurance? So whenever people come back from the field, like it's very easy to do a typo. Sometimes uh, you just have some things that are wrong, points which are not where they belong to be. And to do this kind of thing, she adds an additional step. Hey, thanks. An additional uh, step in between. Here we are. Right, yes, that's it. Um, so she added, on top, of all that, on, on top of all that system, an additional layer. And what this layer here does is it, um, it filters the data and actually um, takes it from their production database and sends from the production database the, uh, in their nightly synchronization jobs out to the mobile fields. However, whenever people come back from the field, what happens in the database is that some checks are applied to it, like if the points are in the region where they belong to, if some basic sanity checks of all the attributes apply, and so on. And if everything is well, they go directly into the production database. However, there is a second database, which is called the quarantine, which is just there for uh, quality assurance. So whenever some of these um, basic uh, sanity checks fail, things will be stored in the quarantine and will stay in there until someone takes care of it. That means uh, we have so, um, someone that is probably Nadia again, or one of her coworkers in the office, just checking what's up in the quarantine. And in case of troubles, in case there is something wrong, most likely she just takes her phone and calls someone and asks like, what, what the reality was like there, corrects it, and as soon as it is corrected, it goes also into production, and when it ends up in production, it's there. So we have an additional step of um, quarantine and quality assurance in there. One day, she calls us and says, hey, there is an issue for, um, we have uh, these uh, service level agreements with our customers. So we need to know who actually um, took um, all the information out there. So I need to have a proper audit trail to see um, who changed what and at what time and how. Um, so for that, she modifies her database once again, and that's a third day copy of the data, which is an archive. Inside the archive, she has um, a copy of all the data um, that she has also in the production, and whenever something changes in production, it is updated in the archive and uh, with a timestamp of when it has changed and who has changed it. And actually, even in the quarantine, if something comes in from the field and goes into the quarantine, it is also put into the archive. So we know like, okay, so somebody took this information from the field, then later on it was by um, some professional in the office edited to go into production. And that way she has a quite a good overview of what is happening out there. And um, if there is some legal issues coming up, she can track down um, who it was and um, what actions to take. So, um, that was it for the whole um, field strategies part already. I realized that I was quite fast on that. Um, we are um, also soon going to launch an additional service, which is um, Qfield Cloud. Qfield Cloud is going to be much easier than the setups that you've seen here before. But um, it's going to integrate, it's going to be a hosted service um, that um, we're going to develop and offer as a, with a nice Qfield integration for synchronization of the data um, for offline and online things. So if you'd like to know more about that, you better uh, drop by at our booth um, and talk to us um, what exactly the plans are. And um, I have also the pleasure to announce um, a crowdfunding initiative. We have actually spent, uh, even though I didn't talk about all the features that we have done in Qfield, uh, we've done uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, like things, uh, we've done a lot of development in Qfield, and uh, we'd like now to um, give you all the possibility to contribute back, and um, 
we'll uh, like as a very first thing, what we what we are uh, is is a long-standing issue. Um, we would like to improve on the gallery, on the, on, on the photo possibilities. Right now we have um, an internal thing as a workaround for a bug which we have with the Android camera. So once we've got that fixed, um, we, we will be able to use the native Android camera again, which means that we can have EXIF information about the location directly in the images. And using the native Android camera with all the cool features like HDR and whatever they uh, can do these native cameras, which uh, the people who develop the cell phones actually are much better at uh, than, than, than we are. Um, and there will also be support for um, naming your, uh, your images, so you can have the image names actually referring to the feature they are for and not just with a random timestamp. So we would really uh, appreciate it a lot if you would check out the, um, the crowdfunding that we, are, we, w that we are launching now. So, <laughs> Already at 15 minutes, like my like talk before. Oh, I see a lot of hands coming up. That's when you get when you stop at 15 minutes already. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. So it's a very interesting and excellent system. So I'd like to ask about the quality control. Could you back to the slide for the quality control? There are many slides, but uh, uh, this one. Yeah, this one or the, yeah, anyway. So, so for example, if you find something error so from the data of mobile, then instead of going back to the server, so you can, if you find the QGIS desktop, you can correct immediately. So that could be an option. So why don't you correct the data, not from the server side, but from the desktop QGIS? So I realized I was a bit too quick and I could have spent one more minute explaining more in detail how that happens exactly. So it's really actually QGIS desktop, which does the, which does the whole correction. So the things like all the data that comes from the mobile part goes first into the quarantine and stays in here if there is some problems or it goes directly up there. To fix the things in here, people use QGIS desktop. So that's, um, that's how it does. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Nice way of presenting the functionality. So I became interested in our characters, and especially Maya, the, the beekeeper. And I have two, two questions concerning her. I mean, f first of all, does she take photos of the beehives? Uh, the second thing is when she goes and puts in, in a new beehive, she's, her clothes are, you know, they all over. All all the covers and all of that. It's difficult to type on the keyboard, so can she uh, use voice recognition or something like that to input data? <laughs> good question, good question. Yeah. Okay, so that's some really good questions there, actually. <laughs> um, what she does for, um, for the photos, you asked. Uh, of course, she takes photos of the beehives because she loves uh, bees and she loves photos, so why not combine the two? Um, for the second question, um, she had some trouble in the, in the beginning with actually, um, with actually typing with her gloves. So uh, now she has uh, some gloves which have a uh, tactile uh, front, so she can actually <laughs> type. Uh, but it's still quite uh, hard to reach all the individual keys. So what she does is she uses this, like on the Google keyboard, you have this, um, this uh, microphone, and if you type it, it w it's like voice to text, so she just uses that, and most of the things are anyway like uh, structured, well-structured attributes and, and, and data schema, so there's not big, big of an issue of uh, writing too much. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, yeah, auto completion on voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's when that's when the smartphone is smarter than you. <laughs> Next. I forgot to tell us about how much more Maya you will be presenting tomorrow. So uh, there was a question about uh, that I promised in the begin beginning to tell more about Maya. Um, that's actually going to be this event here. Um, so tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. It's not the Bolero Room I found out today. Uh, I was once informed that it's the Bolero Room. In fact, it's another one. 
Um, Corale, maybe. Okay. Best bet from the local organization co community is uh, Corale. Uh, look it up. It's in the, in the program, in the schedule as well. Um, we're going to tell you much more about uh, Maya, and uh, we'll also see some of her friends again. And it's, uh, what it is, it's, uh, it's QGIS on the road. It's a short introduction, or not so short introduction. Actually, it's like three sessions, um, one after each other. It's a full track. Um, it's a lot of um, information about how you can use QGIS, and it's actually told by Maya. Maya, the retired, uh, retired GIS specialist who is now a beekeeper, and she's building up all her, all her um, honey production and uh, all the things that she runs into throughout her journey with her bees. And it's, it's quite an entertaining way of seeing uh, what you can do with QGIS and all the functionality from very basic things, but I'm pretty sure um, even for uh, some of the very experienced people, there are some new things to be seen in there. So we'd love to have you have you join there. Hi. Uh, you had a cool presentation. Congratulations. Uh, I have a question about what happens when the field guys come back to office. Is there some, uh, some kind of an automated process of transferring the d data from the tablet or the mobile to the local server or just copy paste from folder uh, the job package um, this is done by a file synchronization service so it's like sync thing but you you can also use Dropbox for to accomplish the same kind of thing and it's just like in the during the night the file in there is replaced by the server with the latest version that is produced on the server uh, from the latest data set. Whereas uh, every evening when you go home and you are in your Wi-Fi area, your local changes are uploaded, pushed to the server to be taken into account there. Directly from the tablet? Directly from the tablet, yes. yes. Yeah, there's quite a couple of apps that allow you to synchronize from the tablet and from the computer. Could, could you give me an example to write it down, please? Sync thing? Sync thing? Sync, Sync like S-Y-N-C, okay. thing like T H I N G. <laughs> yeah, that's an open source app. Uh, I think it's using the BitTorrent protocol. Tim, not? No idea. Good. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Okay. So li latest information uh, from the back corner is uh, it was originally called PT Sync. BitTorrent. Think different two different projects. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they work the same way. Yeah. Okay. There was BT Sync, which was renamed to Resilio, and this one is an open alternative to that other project. But they all use the BitTorrent P2P protocol. Pooh, <laughs> got it right. <laughs> we still have time for more questions, if there are. Yeah, if there is no more questions, may I ask it twice? Yeah, sure. You can ask too. Very, very two questions. So why not Geo Server? Huh. <laughs> um, well, I think it would deserve some more information on how they would integrate perfectly with GeoServer. So uh, I'd, if uh, you think that's a super good idea, um, just uh, come by and I think we, we need to have this bilateral discussion. Um, so far, uh, it's like pretty much um, QGIS integrated. All the, um, all the things like all the symbology and so on is... Uh, is very QGIS centric, so specific, and I'm not sure how well GeoServer works with that. Uh, but maybe there is some smart, some smart way of combining the two things. Then we're very open to inputs. <laughs> All right, who else? So quiet. I can ask some questions. Tim uh, always has about four questions. So. Do you want a friendly question or a difficult question? What about, um, <laughs> what about uh, supporting taking little video clips and reading QR codes so that you can barcode your beehives and um, scan those? That would be very nice. That was the nice one, I think. <laughs> Um, no, that's, um, that, that would be nice. Actually, before that, even, I would, I would um, 
love to have um, audio integration, voice uh, recording integration, because I think like, um, yeah, maybe the voice recognition works quite nice in English, but um, like in Swiss German, Google is not able to handle it yet properly, and I'm okay with them not handling it actually. Uh, <laughs> But um, anyway, yeah, yeah, NSA probably going to handle it, but they're not opening up their services. <laughs> yeah, no, um, no, that that would be that would be really nice, and um, we've planned to come up with a series of um, crowdfundings. Um, so I think that's going to be on one of the on one of the upcoming ones. That would be a really nice functionality. Yes. Do you want the easy question? Now the easy question. Just if you have any 30 seconds. Yeah, you 30 okay. seconds. 30 seconds. What if I'm in the field and I need to make a map um, in a PDF of what I've just been recording? <laughs> well, then you need to create a print composer before configure your QGIS project to have a print composer and then you'd well just create a PDF. You say yes, you can do it. Yes, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen.